morning. Come on. Give him a good place. For that. Let me invite you to stand in honor and reverence to the reading of the Word of God. Good to have you folks here this morning. We had a, a really good early morning service at 8.30 today, and I think we picked up about 10 additional people than what we had last week. And uh, I was counting uh, you folks a few moments ago, and I think we've picked up a few more people here as well on the on this service uh, today. Thank you, girls, for singing. Uh, Adam's doing double duty. He's on the piano over there and trying to lead music. And next week, we're going to have Miss Pam back with us. She's going to be back with us next week, and, and she is going to help us out and, uh, until we can find a new pianist, or unless she's going to be our new pianist. And we're praying that the Lord will open her eyes. <laughs> she's probably watching right now. Uh, she's with her church uh, today, and, and her church is uh, getting started back up, and, and uh, as well as many other churches are, are doing that. So uh, we've had a good day. Thank you all for being here today. Steve McKinney, I walked by your Sunday school class this morning, and you had a sign uh, at the front of your door. It said uh, something about... Cons uh, this is a loud zone. Is there anything to, to that? You know, we're, we got Vacation Bible School is uh, coming up in July, and uh, they're putting some props together and everything. And, uh, you know, in every, every one of our Bible study classes, there's a room number and all and on Steve's uh, room. Did you notice it? <laughs> what did it say? Loud zone or something like that? A Pentecostal zone. Amen. And uh, I tell you, if you've never been in Steve's class, you know how he does. He gets with it. And uh, I like it like that. And I call that early service. Used to call that early service. And uh, appreciate all of y'all having your Sunday school classes. You're getting started back. And uh, many of our activities are as well. We still want to be as safe and careful as we can, you know, concerning, concerning uh, the situation. But, uh, hey, we're, we're, we're open, wide open. Amen. Praise God for that. Romans 13 this morning, Romans 13, God's minister, God's minister. You're going to notice that word at least three times here. A lot of times when you think God's minister, you're thinking maybe of a pastor, uh, uh, someone on staff, uh, but God's talking about his, the government as his minister. Uh, I believe today's message is a very appropriate message for us today. Today is Flag Day, and I want to speak a, a little bit about our flag in just a few moments uh, this beautiful flag that we have here presented today. You love the American flag, amen? amen. We do. Amen. And, um, but let's read the word first, Romans 13. And I'm going to read verse 1 all the way down through verse 7. God's holy, infallible word says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. You know what uh, every soul in the Greek means? It means every soul. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not terror to do good works, but to evil. But you want to be afraid, unafraid, of the authority. Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. That's God's word. We are to get under God's authority and his word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and we give you praise for this Lord's day. This is the day that you've made. And we are rejoicing and we are glad in, in it. We thank you.
for the church gathered. All of our churches around America gathered today in the name of Jesus. We thank you for those gathered around the world in the name of Jesus. Today, Father, we pray that certainly that you would light our fire, that you would allow us to be such a light that will expel the darkness in this world. Dear God, we thank you for Burns View Baptist Church, for our church family. We pray, Father, for your divine protection on our lives. You're our great provider. You're Jehovah Rapha. You're the God who heals. And today, our nation needs healing. Our families need healing. Churches need some healing. And God, you can do it. Nothing's too hard for you. So, Father, we pray for revival. We pray for a mighty move of a holy God. Our nation needs a great awakening. Our nation needs Jesus. He's the only one who can put the love in and take the hate out. And so, Father, we thank you and we praise you. We know you're in charge. You're still on your throne. You still watch over your own. You cannot fail. You must prevail. Today, we have faith in you. Our trust is in Jesus. May you honor your word as you always do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Today is Flag Day. Did you look at your calendar? How many of you knew that today was Flag Day? <laughs> Raise your hand if you knew today was Flag Day. What's next week? Father's Day, one of my favorite days uh, of the year. I, maybe I'll get a soap on a rope. Any of y'all ever got, father's got a soap on a rope? <laughs> Ty, I don't know. But I want to talk about this flag here. Isn't that a beautiful flag? That's a beautiful flag. One of our church members purchased that flag for us here recently. Um, and that is a very beautiful flag. I ha I've had in my study for many years a, a little pamphlet called Our Flag. I actually uh, asked Pam this past week if she could maybe locate uh, some of these on the internet somewhere because I would like to purchase some of them for you folks. Um, she could not find uh, this same pamphlet here, uh, but what we do have is we were able to download and um, make some copies uh, on a piece of paper on the front and back. Uh, they're out in the lobbies for you, and it just talks about flag flying days. You know, those dates in the year that you fly, fly your flag. Some of you fly it all the time. It talks about the U.S. flag code, how to care and how to respect uh, that flag, flag fi uh, facts, and um, all sorts of things, folding the flag, flying it half-staff, and uh, how to properly dispose of flag. You know, there's a certain way you ought to go about all of that. Amen. I want to read to you uh, just the opening uh, portion of, of this pamphlet that I had. Uh, the national flag represents the living country and is considered to be a living thing in, embolic of the respect and pride we have for our nation. Our flag is a precious possession. Display it proudly. The national emblem is a symbol of our great country, our heritage, and our place in the world. We owe reverence and respect to the flag. It represents the highest ideals of individual liberty, justice, and equality for all. And I don't know about you folks, but I stand for the flag. And I kneel and bow only to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that is Jesus Christ. If you agree, give him the glory and the praise for this man. So today I want to talk with you about God's minister. So just keep your Bible open, and we're going to stay in the Word today. And and we're going to talk about God's minister and, and, and really how I am to relate uh, to the government authority that I happen to be under. Uh, this message today is really about the concept of our, of our relationship to government. You know, when the Bible was written, government was a hot-button issue. Uh, it's a hot-button issue of the day. On, on one occasion, uh, there were many that were gathered around Jesus and a man held up a coin and he said to Jesus should I pay taxes to the government and you know what Jesus said you remember what he said he says render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God that's what the Lord Jesus said now I want you to know something ladies and gentlemen if you don't already know this you know when the New Testament was born when God gave birth uh, to his 
church, ladies and gentlemen. It was born under a government that legalized slavery, tolerated abortion, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, taxed severely, violated human rights, and executed large numbers of people. That's the kind of government that the New Testament was born under. And uh, these were the conditions under which Paul wrote the book of Romans. Now, isn't that very interesting? And listen, as bad as that government was in Paul's day, it did do some good things. For example, it established an unprecedented peace for its, all, for its people to enjoy. It built roads that are still used today. It set up a communication system with a common language. It was highly efficient and effective in providing justice despite the many things that it did wrong. And it was, listen, it was under those conditions that Christianity was able to take root and to grow. And what's interesting to me is that in the early church, it faced many, many of the same issues that you and I as Christians uh, face today. So here's the goal in my message this morning. The goal of my message this morning is to take the Word of God and to help us all understand how as Christians we are to relate to government. Now listen, just a, just a mere mention of government in today's climate brings all sorts of negative thoughts and negative feelings. I mean, preacher, you're going to preach on government today? There's not going to be a lot of hallelujah and amens and aisle running in today's message, ladies and gentlemen. Because when you talk about government, I do realize that in today's climate, there's a lot of negative feelings and a lot of negative thoughts. But listen, when you take it from government from a biblical perspective, you will come to an understanding that God did not intend for government to be our enemy, but for government to be our friend, to help us propagate the gospel to the four corners of the world when you see it from a biblical perspective. Now, keep your Bible open, and I want to show you something. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 comes right before Romans chapter 13. Can we all agree on that? Amen. Amen. Romans 12 comes before Romans chapter 13. And notice what Paul wrote in Romans 12, 17 through 21, before he wrote Romans 13. Notice what the Bible says. Writing under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit is the author. God used a human instrument, Paul, to write this. And the Bible says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, underline that. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, now watch this, one of the hard sayings of the Bible. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. Why? Why in the world would I do that? He gives us the answer. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, why? You see, God can turn our enemies and make them our friends. Praise God. God's in the business of doing that. Turning our enemies into friends. So in my message today, I'm going to address the question, what does God say about his minister? And how am I to relate to God's minister? All right, I think that's a topic, that's a subject that perhaps most of us, if not all of us, are very interested in today, considering the climate we are. So here's what I want to do. I want to share with you three principles, three, from the Word of God this morning about, ladies and gentlemen, how I, as a Christian, am to relate 
uh, to God's minister. Number one, principle number one, you ready? Here we go. Principle one, number one is government. How am I to relate to God's minister? Principle number one is government. Now, you'll notice, ladies and gentlemen, three times God calls government his minister. Notice what it says. For he is what? God's minister to do good. You see that? That's one time. The second time, he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath. And then a third time, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this, this very thing. So ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, just like I can see, three times in this passage, God calls government his minister. But then it also, it's also important to note that before God calls government his minister, God says, I'm the one who appoints the government. God says, I'm the one who appoints the minister. Look at what verse 1. Here it is in verse 1. Look at what verse 1 says. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, try to wrap your mind around all that, all right, when you think about it. This is an amazing thing to think about because the Bible says God appoints not just our government authorities, but all government authorities. Now, all the government authority is established by God. That's established here in the Scripture. Now, why? I can think of maybe three reasons why. There are others, but I can think of three reasons why God has given to us government like he has many other gifts. First of all, to ensure that a society works. That's one reason why we have government. Another reason we have government is to control and direct behavior. Another reason we have government is to advance justice. So those are at least three reasons why we have government. And when you look at the role of government from a biblical perspective, it helps us to understand that government authority has been given to us as a gift from God, much like the other gifts we have received to benefit our lives. Now, in studying this passage, I, I've come to understand that, that the Greeks would often use the word government in the same way that they would use a helmsman of a ship. And we all can have an imagination, perhaps, about what the helmsman of a ship would do. A helmsman of a ship would direct that ship. Uh, he would help guide that ship. He would steer that ship, what? In the right direction. And that's the purpose for government, to steer the people in the right direction to help guide the people, the citizens of that government. Now, listen very closely. It may interest you, and it interests me, that Christians have lived under all sorts of government. Amen? I mean, if you name the form of government, Christians have lived under it. We've lived under all kinds of different governments. Christians have lived under monarchies, ruled by kings and queens, Christians have lived under aristocracies, ruled by nobles. Christians like us today, we live under a republic, under a representative form of government. Christians have lived under democracies, where everyone equally participates. So if you look at the history of the Christian church, you're going to discover that Christians have lived under all kinds and all different forms uh, of government, ladies and gentlemen. And you and I know uh, very well that authority can be abused. Those in authority can abuse their authority. Pastors have abused their authority. Teachers have abused their authority. Policemen have abused their uh, authority. Uh, government officials have abused their authority. We all know that authority can be abused. But like the old saying goes, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If the water is dirty, you throw out the bums who made the water dirty. 
That means I'm going to engage. I'm going to register to vote. I'm going to vote. And I'm going to vote for people who share my worldview. People who share my values. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I know there's a lot of Christians who are not going to vote. Ever. And here's the reason. They're looking for Jesus. Jesus Christ is not on the ballot. He's never going to be on the ballot. There is absolutely no perfect candidate, but there are some who share our views a whole lot greater than others. So we need to keep that in mind, ladies and gentlemen. So, so ladies and, and gentlemen, here you have a principle in, in the Bible here, and we may not agree with all the policies. We may not agree with all the politics. We may not agree with all the laws, and we may not agree with the taxes. But the fact of the matter is, concerning government, God has ultimate control. And God has invested His authority in the governments of the world. That's what the Bible says right here, ladies and gentlemen. You can argue with me. That's fine. And probably win. But you, but you can argue with God. You won't win. So there's the first principle and that is government. Now, you ready for the second principle? I like the second principle a whole lot better. The second principle is citizenship. As Christians, we have, praise God, a dual citizenship. We got a dual citizenship. We are citizens of the United States of America, but we're also citizens of heaven. And you'll find that in Philippians chapter 3. So if you want to, or they'll show it on the screens, it's Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Here's what the Bible says. Paul writes to this church uh, at Philippi. And he says, For our citizenship, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord. Je Are you waiting for the Savior? who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his Christ's glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Now let me tell you this. The original recipients of uh, Philippians 3.20 were the people of Philippi. The people of Philippi uh, and Philippi itself, it was an imperial Roman colony located in northern Greece. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, what was that like? Well, it was kind of like Hong Kong, the relationship Hong Kong had with Great Britain. Remember that relationship that they had? Hong Kong had a relationship with Great Britain. Hong Kong used to be a colony of Great Britain, although it's located way, way over there next to China. Philippi was to Rome what Hong Kong was to Great Britain. In other words, Philippi was Rome far away. So think of it that way. Philippi was Rome far away. They were Roman citizens, but they were far away from Rome. They dressed like the Romans. They assumed the customs of the Romans. They lived by Roman law. They exchanged Roman currency. They had a common language. In other words, is that it is as if you were a Roman, but you were a Philippian. That's kind of the way it worked. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as it applies to us, in Christ, you and I have a dual citizenship. We are Americans, but we are Christians. We are citizens of the United States, but we're also citizens of heaven. And our greatest, ladies and gentlemen, and highest Loyalty is to heaven and the king of heaven. Amen. Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen, we are citizens of, uh, of heaven and we are citizens uh, of America. For us, when I think about it, heaven is, is more than a destination. Amen. Are you headed to heaven? Say amen. Man, I'm going to heaven. Praise God. So, so heaven for us is more than a destination. Heaven is our home. The old preacher, the old folksy preacher, Vance Havner, he still lives on today. And old Vance Havner said it this way. He said, if you are a Christian, 
you are not a citizen of this world trying to get to heaven. He said, you're a citizen of heaven trying to make your way through this world. And it's so true, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? So as citizens we, we ought to, uh, of heaven, we ought to think like heaven. We ought to dress like heaven. We ought to behave like heaven. We ought to adopt the laws of heaven and, and live our lives, ladies and gentlemen, like the fragrance of heaven that we ought to live our lives like. So citizenship, praise God. We have a dual citizenship. I'm an American. I praise God for that. But I'm also a citizen of heaven. Now here's where the rubber hits the road. Here's where the application is. Okay, preacher. All right. You're talking about God's minister. You're talking about how I am to relate to God's minister from a biblical perspective. All right. You've already talked about the principle of government. You've already talked about the principle of citizenship. Now let me talk with you about the principle of responsibility. What's my responsibility? All right, well, let's take a look at it. Let's see what God has to say about it. And, and that's where we need to go. You don't need to hear responsibility from me. You need to hear about God, from God. So notice what God says. Look at verse 1. Let some sow. Did y'all hear that? Let many sow. Let every, every sow be subject to the governing authorities. That speaks of our responsibility. Now listen to this. And I know what you're thinking. I know where you are because I'm here there. I'm, I'm right there with you. When, when you read verse 3 through 7, wouldn't it be easier to understand this and comply with this if the backdrop was a godly Christian government? Wouldn't it be easier to understand? Wouldn't it be easier to comply with? But ladies and gentlemen, got news for you. Most of the nations on planet Earth, their God is not the Lord. Even in America today, our country, a debate is raging on whether or not we are a Christian nation. That's been going on for a long time. Are we really a Christian nation? Is our God really the Lord? It's a debate. People are still debating over that, ladies and gentlemen. So here's... The million dollar question. How do Christians relate to a nation whose God is not the Lord? How do I relate to a nation whose God is not the Lord? So you not to listen, you got to keep in mind that when the original recipients of Romans, when they heard this for the first time, when they read this for the first time, they were living in a nation led by people whose, whose God was not the Lord. That's the kind of nation it was. They lived in a government that used its tax money for all kinds of abominable things. They lived in a government, ladies and gentlemen, that persecuted, enslaved, imprisoned, overtaxed, and crucified Christians by the tens of thousands. That's the kind of government they were in when they heard these words for the very first time. And it's like, what? That's the atmosphere in which Paul wrote Romans 13. And yet the Holy Spirit of God says this, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. And here's what's amazing to me when you study your history. You study church history, you study world history, and, and, and you know history is under attack, by the way. There are revisionists out there who want to rewrite the history, and it's a crying shame. History is history, and if you don't learn from history, you're going to repeat it, the bad stuff. But nevertheless, that's a sermon for another day, all right? But listen, ladies and gentlemen, these people, here's what happened. Here's what amazes me about ancient Rome. In the early church, these people in the early church got in line with the Word of God. And when they began to relate to the government the way God wanted them to relate to the government, in time, they won the government. They won it. They won ancient Rome. They did it. It took generations. 
But eventually, this whole Roman, Roman Empire legally converted to Christianity. And what's so stunning about this is that they did not win the empire with weapons. They didn't win the empire with litigation. They didn't win it with protests. They didn't win it with marches. They didn't win it with anger. They didn't win it with political organizations. That ain't how they won it. They turned that entire nation on its head with love, integrity, respect, and submission. Those early Christians obeyed 1 Timothy, and I want to share it with you. And you say, what am I to do in a nation that's drifting from God? What am I to do if I live under a, under a government that's not friendly to Christianity? I'm going to give it to you. Here's what God says you are to do, and I'm to do. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Here's what I'm going to read to you. Here's how God says I'm to do it. If I want to flip it, here's how I'm going to flip it. Therefore, I... Here's what Paul writes to his young prodigy. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. Praise God. And to come to the knowledge of truth. That's how it's done, ladies and gentlemen. It's done through the power of prayer. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. If God's on your side, who can be against you? Years ago, there was a famous chaplain in the Senate, and he was asked this question. Do you pray for the senators? And he says, I look at the senators and I pray for a nation. Well, praise God. I look at our senators and I pray for a nation. I look at our house members and I pray for our nation. Amen? So, folks, let me tell you something. There is a darkness sweeping our land. We know there's a darkness sweeping our land. We have a crisis with many in authority today. Teachers are not honored in school. Law enforcement officers are not honored in society. Parents are not honored at home. Preachers are not respected in their churches. Public servants are not respected in government. And many young people have been taught not to respect authority because they learn, and they learn that from adults. And yet God says in Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now listen, that does not mean that man's law trumps God's law. God's law trumps man's law. And that does not mean that I have to obey an unjust law. You see, our highest loyalty is to heaven and the king of heaven. Now, I want to share something with you that uh, I found very interesting this past week. You talk about flipping a nation. And, uh, and you know, China has been in the news for quite a while now. And uh, President Trump, who I love dearly, he, called, he says, China, China, China. That's how he says it. And, uh, but China has been in the news uh, a lot lately. And they have been bad actors, of course, in this coronavirus thing. Uh, they have, uh, it's been discovered that be, they have been bad actors in these riots and uh, things that's going on, this turmoil in our nation. In fact, the leader of China just recently said, maybe that within this past week, he said, we are trying to save the world from the United States. That's what this communist ha has just uh, said. In fact, when it comes to the church in China right now, the, the communist regime is making attempts to rewrite the Bible and give it to the churches. China, it, it, it's, it's a bad government. That communist regime is terrible. It didn't get mo no much worse than that. 
But let me tell you something. In, before 1949, so put your mind in a frame of reference of 1949. What happened just before 1949? The end of what? World War II. So in 1949, it was estimated in China there was one million Christians in China in 1949. And they had come to Christ under the nationalistic government, a government which was surprisingly sympathetic to Christians. They allowed missionaries to come in. The missionaries came to the ports. They moved their, their way inland. And up to one million Chinese came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But when the communist regime came into power in 1949, the missionaries were kicked out. The missionaries were kicked out, and persecution against Christians was unspeakable. The exact numbers are, are not known, but it is believed that the one million declined to 500,000 or maybe 600,000. You say, what happened to half a million Christians? Well, they didn't just pack their bags and, and move and go to Motel 6 somewhere. <laughs> they were executed. The Chinese government executed them. Nearly a half a million of them, ladies and gentlemen. The reason for the shrinkage is not because they, they decided to move out or even had the freedom to, to move out. It was terrible. And that terror continued for a long, long, long time. But in the years that followed, ladies and gentlemen, until today, it, under the worst of governments, China, under the worst of government conditions, the church, ladies and gentlemen, under the People's Republic of China has grown to an estimation of 60 million Christians. And that's a conservative estimate. You say, preacher, what is your point? Here's my point, ladies and gentlemen. We, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ does not need a friendly Government in order to propagate and advance the kingdom of God. We can grow in the worst of conditions. In fact, the church grows best under persecution. You look at it. You look at church history and, and study it. There's an old air proverb, all sunshine causes a desert. And man, if you had no rain, guess what? Your, your tomato plants would dry up. Your garden will be done. If the deer don't get it, the drought will get it. All right? But ladies and gentlemen, into every life some rain must fall. And sometimes some thunder, sometimes some lightning. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ does not need a friendly government in order to advance the kingdom of God. China is an example of that. At the very end of the Bible, one of the saints of the New Testament, John the Revelator, you, you know, I think I kind of get loud. You know, I've, I watch myself on the television sometimes, and I tell myself, I need to be a little more professional. <laughs> you know, we finally got me on air. I turned into a televangelist overnight. <laughs> the coronavirus has, has elevated me. And I listen to that, and I say, man, I'm too loud. But I like being loud. And I just can't calm down, because the one who lives in me really is alive. If he's alive in you, praise God. But anyway, John, John was penning the last words of the Bible, and he did it under tremendous pressure. You who have studied Revelation, you know, on the Isle of Patmos, John, the Revelator, he was under tremendous pressure. And it, it was in those last words of the Bible that he looked forward to a future, a future that would someday, when all Christians would be gathered together, not identified by a loyalty to Rome, not identified by a loyalty even to the United States. But he looked at a time when Christians would be gathered in the homeland, people of every language, every nation, every tribe. And he described that wonderful day when we as citizens of heaven will take up our residency in heaven. And here's what he wrote. In Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, John wrote this. He was the human instrument by which the Holy Spirit spoke. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. It's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. The kingdoms of this world 
have become the kingdoms of our Lord. And of his Christ, he shall reign forever and ever. And until that day comes, ladies and gentlemen, we are to live faithfully and pledge allegiance to the Lamb of God. Let's stand and let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the message today. It's difficult to wrap our minds around this. Maybe even difficult to obey because we live, we are living more in a nation that is drifting rapidly away from your precepts and principles. There's violence in the land. There's hatred uh, in, in the land. There's wrongdoing in the land. There's corruption in, in the land. Uh, the rule of law is being trampled upon. So many things are going wrong. But at the same time, God, your word says, My, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church of the Lord, the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ is alive and well today. And dear God, we pray that we'll continue to live under your banner, that we will get under the authority of the word of God and, and, and pray like never before. Help us to be salt and light, which means I need to engage. Pray, register to vote, vote, and, and that's the way that I could change the conditions. And, and Lord, I just pray for our people in this time and in this place and in this land. Dear God, help us to win people to faith in Christ. The social engineers and, and the social justice warriors, they have their playbook. They've been running it for a long, long time. And it doesn't change the condition of the heart. The only way that the heart can change is for the individual to give that heart to Jesus Christ. And by that individual changing, he becomes a change agent for his community he becomes a change agent for his family, his friends, and those all around him. Dear God, we don't want to walk in confusion. We, we don't want to walk around shrugging our shoulders as if we've been defeated. Dear God, your word tells us that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And today, we hold the banner of Jesus Christ high. I've read the back of the book. We win. We win. We win. And thank you, God, for allowing me to be on your team. If there's somebody here today who's never been saved, let them come to faith in Jesus today. If there's somebody who's drifted away from God, today would be a good day. Say, God, I've drifted away from you. I want to be in your very center, the center of your will. Whatever it may be, the altar is open. May the Holy Spirit of God, that's real. The angels of glory are here. There are unseen guests today. May we respond as the Holy Spirit leads us in Jesus' name. Amen. Come as they pray.